Hey guys, thank you everyone for joining us today. I am here with David Emerson and we are having a Behind the Veil interview all about near-death experiences. So what I find so interesting about the way in which this came about is that um, I had been crowdsourcing and I had asked on my social media pages if anyone knew anybody that had experienced a near-death experience, not knowing that I have a social mm -hmm. media friend that actually has experienced several of them. Um, and I love that you reached out to me and you let me know that you had experienced several because that kind of got me thinking like, how well do we actually really know the friends that we have on social media, <laughs> right? They were like, are we just following people because we want to get like a look inside the window of their life? Do we really even know them at all? But I think it's awesome that you've, I mean, maybe you didn't experience it to be awesome, but I think it's awesome that you are, you had these experiences and you're open and willing to talk about them today. So David, I understand that you have had several near death experiences. Yes. Can you share what some or all of them were? The most, the most, the one that you would call the most real near death experience uh, where you have, you have like, the experience where you feel like you're dead and you're kind of just gone and you're out of body um, is when I sank 40 feet to the bottom of a lake when I tried to do a double backflip. I was seven, 17 or 18 and I landed on my face and was knocked unconscious and woke up at the bottom about a minute later and had, as you can imagine, lungs, water. Um, I, I woke up, my feet hit the bottom, and I thought that I was, I thought that I was dreaming at first, and then I was wondering why my lungs hurt so much, and then I thought I was dreaming that I was in a river because my ears were so full of water, um, and I remember Basically, that was like the immediate, because my eyes, my eyes were open, but it was completely black down at the bottom. I couldn't see anything. So it was all sound and feel and everything. Um, and I heard, this, this is a time in my life when I was very into classic rock. I was kind of coming into my spiritual awakening. And I was listening to a lot of Led Zeppelin. And I heard the song, um, When the Levee Breaks, which has a slowed down intro. And so as I'm waking up, I hear the sound of when the levee breaks playing in my ears. And then I see the angel of the Icarus, the boy who flew too close to the sun. Um, that was like the only thing I could see. It looked like a bright light. And he was kind of pointing the way up. And that's I also got that tattooed on my chest the next day. Um, and that was actually already an original plan. So I see this angel, and in my mind, it's Jimmy Page. It's the lead, the lead guitarist for Led Zeppelin. And in that, and then it all goes away. And that's when I realize, oh, you just jumped off of a cliff. You're at the bottom of a lake. Uh, you need to do some motions. And so I start moving, trying to swim, not knowing, not having any feel for gravity or like which way is up or down, just hoping I go in the right direction. Um, and I'm just flailing my arms around trying to swim. And eventually I get high enough to where somebody kicks me in the head and then they grab me and pull me out of the water. And my resuscitation was really when they yanked me out of the water and threw me onto a kayak. And then my chest hit the kayak at like the perfect angle to make me just spew up and throw up all the water. Um, and then I black out again, a couple of minutes. Wow. So, okay. So how long do you approximate that you were actually out Over a for? minute. Over a how minute. Long? Oh Over my God. Minute. Yeah. Um, they, they, they had all, they, it, it was summer. It was a pretty popular um, cliff. Um, everybody had already called 911. Um, everybody was already like, oh, wow, we just watched somebody die. And everybody, when I came up, everybody was screaming and they all thought I was dead. And yeah, they were like, you were down there way too long to be alive. 
Okay, so first and foremost, I'm just gonna share that um, when I spoke with David last week, I actually said I didn't wanna to know too much about your experiences because I wanted to kind of have the same um, experiences as my viewers are gonna have when they're watching this. So I didn't know any of this. I just knew that you had had several near-death experiences and you did share with me that you had seen an angel. So you had been knocked out and you were slowly coming to, you were at the bottom of a lake and how deep was this lake? 40 feet, 40 feet. Oh my dear God. Yeah, we, I, I measured it 20 different times because I used to fish there too. That's cool. Holy hell. Yeah, it's deep. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, this is insane. So you were at the bottom of a 40 foot lake, <clears throat> completely had blacked out and you had seen an angel. Yes, ma'am. And the angel was indicating which way was up. Yeah, yeah, apparently. That's not something I put together at the time, but that's the way it went. And that's the way I attempted to swim. And that was the right way. So, yes, it did, it did point me in the right direction. Do you feel that this angel is one of your guardian angels? Absolutely. Um, guardian angel, I think it's a kind of a metaphor for my entire life. It's the Icarus. It's the boy. His dad made him the wax wings and he said, don't fly too close to the sun. And he flew too close to the sun and his wings melted and he fell. And that was kind of like constant thing that my dad always told me was don't do anything stupid. And he literally said that to me like a couple hours earlier when I went to go <laughs> into this cliff. Don't do anything stupid. And I did something stupid. And that was the result. Did you know at the time that you were doing it, this was considered something stupid? Or first of all, how old were you? Uh, it was August. I was 17 or 18. I, th I think I was 17. Okay, so that's definitely the time to do stupid shit like that. Yeah, of course. But at the time that you were doing it, did you think that it was stupid? Or was there any kind of foresight about it? Oh, I knew it was stupid. Okay. Definitely. Definitely. And do you feel like this guardian angel Icarus has been a constant present in your life? Do you, can you almost feel like how he has been with you even prior to this? Or yeah. do you feel like he's more connected to you since then? Um, like since you had the awareness of him or it? Definitely. But I, I've, I've known I have a guardian angel that is just on overtime. Um, several car accidents like when i was 15 um i flipped a f-250 in alaska um and 100 percent should have been dead had a full tank of diesel uh like exterior tank of diesel working alaska um had like a branch going through the window where i should have been um but i wasn't buckled um so, and I didn't have a scratch. I didn't have a scratch. Like just several, several different things where no scratches and you 100% should be dead. You like, my, there's a like, recurring joke in my family that David does not have any lives left. David, he is, he is used. He's on his ninth life. David is not allowed to do anything stupid. My brothers can go do things. They can jump off the cliff. I have to watch because he does not have any, any lives left to play around with. So I want to get this straight. So you were in a car accident. You were not buckled. Had no. you actually have been buckled, you would have been dead because something went through the windshield. What was it, a stick? And it branch. would have actually, it was a branch, and it actually would have penetrated your body and killed you had you been buckled. Yep. But the fact that you were not buckled is what saved your life. Yeah, we're not suggesting really like anybody that story. doesn't buckle your seatbelts. Please don't take it that yeah. way. I'm just, I'm yeah. actually just reveling or marveling rather at this idea at how you actually survive. And the car completely flipped. So something that on its own would have probably have killed you, you're compounding that with the fact that you were not wearing a seatbelt. But even had you had been wearing a seatbelt, you would have been dead. You are like so divinely protected. This is bananas. Yeah. Oh my bit. dear God. Okay. So how do you feel? All right. So we have sank to the bottom of a lake, had a car accident. What other of your lives should have been extinguished? Um, what was not? 
So I went into um, underwater construction, underwater welding uh, about um, two or three months after I drowned. Um, that was that was kind of comic and um, and there were that there were several instances there. It's a dangerous job. That's actually why I got out of it is because so many people die that you just don't hear about. Um, there was an instance where I was several, not several, a couple seconds away from being eaten by an alligator. If it weren't for, if it weren't for the intuition of a man I worked with to tie a rope to me so that he could pull me out of the water if he needed to. If it weren't for that, and this happened like a couple minutes before I get rushed by a gator, he decides, he's like, you know what? I'm gonna tie something to him. And basically from the boat, they could see a gator coming to rush me. And he had a hold of my line and they just said, hold on. And he yanks me out of the water and I see like gator like snatch in front of me. Oh my God. Yeah. And then, and then there's just several others where I've gotten trapped is underwater where we're like, uh, we're not really sure how we're going to get you out. And you like, you might be screwed. Um, several cliffs, uh, lots and lots of concussions from snowboarding and all extreme sports you can think of. So, I mean, those, those, I wouldn't quite consider those like the real depth of near death because you don't like cross through the veil. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the guardian angel saving my butt consistently, yeah, lots, lots of those. So why do you think you've had so many of these near death experiences? One, including an angel. That one, that one, I think was, it was a major wake up. That was a major, major wake up call. Uh, that was, I, that was God, 100%. That was God, higher power, divine intervention, a wake up call to, hey, uh, get your life together. You're here for a reason. You're not just on earth at this time to be an idiot. Get it together. Come find your higher self. I see that as kind of like God and a manifestation of my higher self coming to save me or like future self kind of thing. Um, and really just a wake up call to go find a purpose. You're here to do something. I'm not just saving you because I feel like it. It's, it's, I, I see it as a lot of responsibility. I see it as they've intervened so many times. I have a lot of responsibility to make up I'm on borrowed time. So the question then is, how do you, how were you at that time living? Were you living in such a way that you were just wasting time and you were just being like a stupid kid? And if that's the case, why do we have, why do we have you now while some other people who have had these near-death experiences, they don't, they're not saved, but you were saved. I understand feeling the sense of responsibility, but why were you really saved? while other people going through this aren't, in your opinion. Why was I saved? Um, I, I, know, I know I have the ability to serve the world. Uh, my, name is, my name on Instagram is David of Gaia, and Gaia is Earth in her most harmonious form. Um, I know for sure I was put here to help the collective consciousness get back to a more harmonious state with Earth. I think it's all of my kind of near deaths have all been like, it's never been anything like a drug OD or anything like that. It's all been out in nature. It's all been out in nature. Like when I was driving the truck, I was out in the middle of everything. Everything in my life has been out in nature or surrounded by water. Um, I definitely feel like I have this idea of hydrating consciousness because we've been just humans have been obviously anybody who's watching this channel knows this um, just lied to given propaganda given 
a bunch of lies about the world and how we're supposed to live. And I'm very young. And I feel like my goal and mission is to help young people learn how to live their lives in a harmonious way with the planet so that we can pass on that tradition and enhance that instead of the way we're going. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that actually makes a lot of sense. And that's really, really beautiful. I think you made a a very interesting connection there that all of the near-death experiences you had were connected to nature. So it was almost as if mother nature, mother Gaia was trying to like wake you up. Like, yo, you have a purpose here. It's connected Mm -hmm. to me, it's connected to earth. So all of these experiences were happening with her. Yeah, yeah. That is absolutely wild. It's like it's like when I when I would get the closest to her, because you don't you don't get much closer than like diving into a lake. You're you're fully you're fully immersed in it. Whenever I would get the closest and like the most in, intense in emotion, like whenever I would feel the most adrenaline, Earth would kind of like, hey, wake up, dude, wake up, get on your path. We need your help. We need you to quit. You know, screwing around. You're here to you're here to serve. You're here to enjoy too, but you're also here to serve. I love that. I think that's such a powerful message. And like you're saying, you're so young. I think it's a really powerful message because so many of, of the, and I'm I mean I'm I'm significantly older, but you know, at the risk of sounding like any typical um, middle aged person, talk, you know, like talking to a young person, it's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like thinking of all the conversations I've had with my elders through the years, you know, and that's kind of why I'm laughing, but at the risk of sounding the same way, which is that so many of the kids, the young kids by today's standards, there's a, this idea of just wanting to indulge our senses in having a good time and taking what the world has to offer, right? It's, it's, what is the world going to give me? It's not a sense of responsibility that we have to give back. So what's so notable and interesting is that even at your young age, you have this level of recognition and awareness that you're here for something bigger than that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, definitely. Now, I noticed that you say yes, ma'am, a lot. And that makes me wonder if you have military um, or if you were raised by a military father or if you served in the military. Yes, ma'am. Um, dad was Coast Guard for 33 years. Yep. And then and I went was... underwater construction, which isn't quite military, but every single person who was in it is ex-military. And I worked mostly on like military contract. And was your dad um, around a lot or was he deployed? Were you moving a lot as a child? Can you talk a little bit about your upbringing? Yeah, of course. Um, dad, and I'll preface this, the man is amazing. He is a million times better than he has any excuse of being from what he was brought up with. Um, he, no, he, he, was not, he was not around. Um, he is he is the 65th ancient mariner in the coast guard in the history of the coast guard um meaning he has over 20 years of sea time so he has literally been on a boat for over 20 years i think it was like 21 or something um and i am 25 and i did not see him a lot i did not see him a lot um i grew up with three little brothers oldest of four boys uh, so I was immediately put into a leadership position, which I am super duper grateful for. Um, I'm in turn best friends with my mom because we are we were kind of a team growing up. Um, and moved around a ton, moved around a ton. Um, he because he was in for 33 years. There's a reason he they kept him in so long is because he was constantly ranking up like usually you move every like three four five years he was every two or three every two or three years he's ranking up getting restationed or going somewhere new um so at this point in my life i've moved 11 12 times uh the longest i've been anywhere is about four years um 
10 years on and off in Alaska, about five in Washington, and then Oregon, South Carolina, Virginia, California, Arizona, Michigan, Florida. That's about it. Can you share then, being somebody that has moved so much, how that has shaped the view that you have of the world or your place even in it? Definitely, definitely. Um, I could not be more grateful for anything than the fact that I got to move around so much, especially when, and not to knock on South Carolina, but when I lived in South Carolina, the consciousness of people, um, I would call it a little more stagnant, a little more dehydrated, because vast majority of people that I met there had never been more than a state away. And I believe humans are migratory. Like we are before civilization, before crops and wheat and everything. And to keep us in one place, we were migratory. I had to move around. I got to do that. And it felt very natural. Um, and I think I was able to mature a lot from one, being able to move around and see all of the different people in different parts of the country and then also having the little brothers always I was kind of like immediately a leader from mm -hmm. a very young age and always like just helping 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 leading um and I got to see I got to see so much we never really vacationed we never really vacationed because we just always were moving around um but being getting getting to see Alaska, getting to see Washington, Michigan, um, that definitely shaped like my soul and my resonance with the earth. I got to ley line. I got to grid, um, which I recently found out that's what that was. And having a lot of experiences and a lot of energies in different parts of the country um, and parts of Canada um, definitely shaped who I became and why I'm so passionate about the earth because I got to see so many different parts of it and like see her in her most beautiful and then see Seattle at its most terrible. And Los Angeles, that's most terrible. And DC, at its most terrible. And the Olympic Forest, at its most beautiful. And just the, the different parts and where they've been destroyed and where they've been kept and where people live the most harmoniously, where people are the happiest, and then where people are just completely out of alignment with the way that humans naturally live. That is so interesting. And it kind of also makes me wonder, um, do you feel like also because you had moved so much, you have more of a sensitivity to the different energies and vibrations of the locations that you lived in? Like, in other words, maybe you were somebody that is naturally um, sensitive to the environment that you're in, but because you've had so many varying experiences in so many different kind of environments, it gave you the opportunity to get even more sensitive to it and tap in even more. I would say yes, yes, and the exact opposite. Um, I think I, I was able I was able to harness a sense of sensitivity to the locations that I'm in, but then also not be sensitive at all to the location that I'm in because I've experienced so many mm -hmm. and anything negative doesn't really affect me anymore. Like when I went, when I made the move from like the middle of the forest to Los Angeles, huge effect, huge effect. Whenever, whenever I would go from the forest just to Seattle, the, the vibrations and the cars and the frequencies of the city would just wreck me. Um, but going kind of deep into those after a while, I can be sensitive to them, but also turn it off kind of like emotional regulation. Like I, I can regulate the way my body is operating within a certain 
frequency. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And it actually also kind of leads me to question this idea that because you've had these varying experiences and where you have kind of lived off the grid and you have lived in uh, very, very large cities as well, and because you also had shared that moving had given you this experience of being migratory, which felt very natural to you. Can you speak a little bit about what felt more, without the emotional regulatory side, without saying you could turn off, you know, when you're in a, in a place where you don't necessarily feel that same congruency in the energy, but can you speak a little bit about what you think is the most natural habitat for humans to live in? Ooh, that's a good question. The most natural habitat. I would say, I would say it depends on a little bit on your ethnicity. I would say it depends on depends on where you were raised. I think our bodies adapt to where we were raised. Like right now, I'm in Arizona. Um, and I was raised mostly in Alaska, so not my most natural habitat, but I can run with it. Um, I would say, I would definitely say migrating to me feels the most natural. Like whenever I, I like to get into a space, ground into it, learn everything I can from it, make the connections I need to experience everything that I need to in one area and then after a couple of years I feel my energy calling me elsewhere mm. and as I'm getting older I'm starting to think that I might be a snowbird I might be one of those people that lives in Arizona in the winter and goes to Washington or Alaska in the summer I have a lot of family that does that and I'm like wow that actually makes a lot of sense um but I do, I do think, I do think that living in one place your entire life, no, I don't think it, I think if you are going to do that, I think you need to travel a lot for good periods of time. Um, but yeah, I think, I think being completely stationary and never leaving your hometown is just not, not healthy. You're not, you're not supposed to experience you're not, you're, not, you're not supposed to spend so much of your earth experience in one geographical location, in my opinion. My opinion. I don't think it. I think that's a big part of the reason the earth collective consciousness has manifested so many of its issues because humans are stagnant. We're sitting in one place. We're looking at our phones. I'm looking at you at a screen. We sit in our little boxes. We're not moving. We're consuming. We're looking for things outside of ourselves to like satisfy us, the immediate gratification. Like I, when I'm sitting, I get tired. When I like, I need caffeine to stay awake if I'm going. But if I'm out moving, out working, I'm completely awake. My, my body, my body is meant to be migratory, in movement, flowing. I think that's really well said. And I love that you're touching upon that as well. I think there's so much of this overconsumption in um, specifically the United States, because I, I have family that has lived out of the United States. And they have shared that when they come back to the United States, they feel like there's just something in the energy here. Like you go into a shopping mall and it's like you feel compelled to buy things. It yeah. might not even be things that you need. You just feel like, oh, I'm in a mall. I need to buy things. And I think part of that is we're looking to fill the part of ourself that is meant to be having these experiences. We're filling it with things instead of the experiences. Yes. On the shopping malls, I don't have entire proof on this, but this is a conspiracy that I'm pretty sure is true. I know Walmarts have like sacred geometry under them, built underneath them to like confuse the crap out of your mind and get you into a consumption mindset mixed with the fluorescent lighting. They do that on purpose. Like that's, that, that is very intentional. When you walk into like really big, like a Costco or a Walmart or a big, I don't even know, um, those big guys, you get 
really confused and you're like, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. So people that are really sensitive, like the real hardcore empaths, they'll walk into those and like freak out. I know people that can't even go into those stores by themselves without just floating. See, so yeah, I think all that's all that's important. Well, okay, that is first of all wild. I didn't realize they had like sacred geometry under the store. It makes so much sense because I was just back home in New York over the holidays. And I don't even know if we have a Walmart out here in LA. Maybe we do, but if we do, I've never seen it. But there's not much to do where my, my mom lives, but there's a Walmart. And I actually went to the Walmart like two or three times because it was kind of like a novelty experience, like, because I don't have one out here, you know? Um, it's like, I guess, if you go to like Florida, you'd want to go to Disneyland for the experience of, you know, going there. The way that store was laid out made no sense to me. Just from like a, even a layout perspective, like I was, well, I was all confused, confused exactly what you're saying. I was walking around. I was like, what, where, where? I had to stop and ask multiple times, like, where's the water? Where are like hand towels? Where's paper towels? Where was hand soap? It did not make sense the way the store was laid out, but also that layer of confusion that you're talking about, that is just mind blowing right now. It's a perfect storm. It's a perfect storm. I mean, if you, if you think of if you think of anything that's going on in the world, they're really good at it. Like if you if you look at any any situation, the food, the COVID. I don't know if you can say that on YouTube anymore. I say C nineteen. Yeah, the C-19, the jab, the everything. They're genius. They're genius. They spill billions and trillions to market to us and to confuse us. And they're, they're really, really, really good at it. And they stay up. They're the people that stay up all night and think of how to completely manipulate and control and make your lives hell. And when you do that, you come up with some really good ideas and then they do it. And it works really well. I wonder how much of this, well, here's also a, quest, a question. If it's sacred geometry, the, just the title alone, sacred, seems mm. to imply that it would be for our benefit. So are they somehow changing the geometry to make it work against us as opposed to for us? From what I'm aware of, yes. I mean, think of like the pentagram. It's geometry maybe not so much sacred geometry it has a purpose um but I, I would i would classify it as sacred geometry even if it's not used in a benevolent way that's a really good example so it kind of makes me wonder a lot of the cities that people are living in now how many of those also have some sort of sacred geometry laid out in the city planning before it actually comes to pass Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, now, DC. DC has a ton of it. DC has a pentagram. Um, I'm sure Los Angeles has a ton of it. I know Seattle does. That place is a best cluster word. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. It's everywhere. They're very smart. They're very smart. So I think that also kind of makes me want to like circle back to this this idea of what you had experienced going to all of these different cities where you could kind of like turn the experience off that you were having, or you could allow yourself to have it fully. Is this something that you found you were able to do only because of the experiences of moving, or is this something that you always had inside of you? You just kind of like perfected it. I think honestly, it kind of sends back to the near death experiences. Like I, one of one of my one of my gifts is I'm able to take past experiences in my head and establish that give give them an establishment. And even if even if even if during the time that doesn't appear to be what it means, like I could I can go back and take instances from when I've been traveling all over the place and find things that I learned from them that I can apply now that at the time I had zero idea that's what I was learning. Like it, it was never connected until we got present. Um, 
And I don't think that part of my brain was activated at all until I had near death experiences, dove incredibly deep into meditation and got into the intentional rewiring of what's going on inside of my head. So I think I was learning all of those types of skills and having those experiences that were necessary to graph that ability. But until I kind of upgraded to this certain level of frequency of self, those things were never going to be brought. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was almost like it was laying dormant inside of you, waiting to be yes. activated. Yeah, sleeping, sleeping DNA, sleeping DNA. There's one thing that Jordan Peterson talks about, and I resonate with this a ton because it is true. Um, there are parts of your DNA that will not become activated unless you move geographically. If you look at the ley lines of the planet, if you look at the magnetic frequencies, the electromagnetic frequencies, the Schumann, the weather patterns, Earth is different. It's like walking into a different vibration or a different room everywhere you go. So if you never step into that room, you're never going to activate that part of your. That's why I am obsessed with getting everywhere, every mm -hmm. every trail, every new little hike lake waterfall it all it activates different parts of the brain all the meridians when i go around places i'm a tree hugger when i go places i hug the tree literally hug them as tight as i can because i know that they have a frequency that my body has never experienced before like barefoot everywhere rub my face in the dirt i get in every water i can get in frequency that is going to activate you and you just never know you just never know that if I go and hop in that waterfall right there that's freezing that is going to put me on a path that I'm supposed to be on activate and connect something that I never would have before you sound like you're very um adventurous also yeah this sense of adventure but it also sounds like maybe you had some of that inside of you when you were younger as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious if you feel like through the experience of moving and perhaps having these different parts of your DNA activated through those experiences, if it's brought more to the fore things that you already had inside of you, but were maybe not quite as active. Yes. Say that again. <laughs> okay. Uh, sometimes I get a little like too cerebral with the questions. Um, so going back to what we had said initially, how we started this, you had these multitude of near-death experiences. And maybe those came from what we would call at that time, stupid decisions that you had been making. But maybe those were also adventurous ah. decisions that you were making. Yeah. So did you perhaps have that adventurous spirit inside of you, but it wasn't completely developed until you started really coming into yourself more? Um, yes. Okay. So I think the, the way that my mind looked at the things that I was doing wasn't in the frame of like, I'm, I definitely wasn't thinking I'm going to jump off this cliff because the water is going to activate certain levels of frequencies in me. Um, do, however, I don't put that together. Um, after every 33 feet, every 33 feet in the water um, is a different atmosphere. Mm. Most humans will never experience a, another atmosphere. You will be in this one, and that is it. In a plane, and then you don't even really get it. Um, I know, I do 1,000% know that because I've researched this a lot. And the deepest that I've ever been is 165 feet. That is four or five or six atmospheres. I can't remember. Um, but that does activate DNA and the cells of your body because of the pressure. So I think attempting to bring that back to what you're asking, I didn't think that my adventurousness as a kid, 
I wasn't doing it intentionally to activate different parts of me, but I absolutely believe that my kid self was being guided by my much older self in order to get kind of sped up to a rate where I needed to be. I love that. Okay, so that actually is going to segue perfectly into this idea. <laughs> it's real life over here. Um, I think that's actually going to help refine the question that I want to ask, which is to say, mm, you didn't have the consciousness at that time in I am this way because it's going to awaken dormant frequencies inside of me. But at an older age, you were living more consciously with that awareness. So it's almost like you could say you were being divinely guided. And it kind of just makes me wonder, like, I kind of, I always like this idea of kind of reframing the things that we've gone on, we've experienced in our life, where it's not like the worst thing that has ever happened. It doesn't matter what it is. It's not the worst thing. But that all the experiences that we've gone into, even if we're not going to bring the soul component into it, which is we have these soul contracts, or so we're going to have these experiences. But if we are maybe in some way, we can say we're even being divinely guided to go through these experiences because it's going to awaken different parts of ourselves, different experiences that we wouldn't have ordinarily. Yes. Yes. Was there a question there? <laughs> Just sharing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think no matter, no matter what you go, no matter what you go through, it, it's happening for you. Like it, it's that very That's common right. idea that I think everybody, I think everybody is kind of just aware of that at this point. If you do any kind of personal development, or at least you need to teach your brain that everything that is happening is happening for you. It's happening to you. Everything is happening for you. Like I kind of, kind of forget at this point that some people don't think like that. Um, I, I have, I, I, Slightly insane sense of gratitude for the negative things that happen in my life because I've just trained it to see all everything as it's getting me closer to where I need to go. So like every, it's weird. Something, something that sucks will happen in my life. And I'll be like, oh man, this sucks. Life is like punching me in the face right now. Awesome. That means something good is coming. Like it's, it's it's just completely ingrained in my mind that all of the negative BS crap things that will happen to you are getting you closer. They're training you. They're refining you. They're building you. Like to the strongest people, you will be given the hardest. And one of the reasons, yeah, that, that's definitely one of the reasons that I love having really hard, terrible things happen is because that means I'm growing stronger. Like if nothing, if nothing challenging is coming, if the universe is not like taking a bat and smacking me over the face, then I'm probably not doing something right. Yeah. It's like that idea of we can either migrate and have these experiences or we can be dormant in our energetic expression and just be where we are. Yes. Yes. If you sit dormant, you're just, you're not going to grow. Your soul isn't going to grow. It's not going to expand, enhance the way that God intended it to do. People, nobody, nobody doesn't feel the call to go travel. Nobody looks at a picture of everyone. If, if they do, it's, it's ego, it's scarcity. It's, I don't have enough money. Like that's not my life. And those are all things that are placed upon us by the dark force. Yeah, absolutely true. But you, so you're saying that you've kind of um, trained yourself to be incredibly optimistic, but it even sounds like you had that inside of you because you were saying earlier how you were the oldest of uh, four boys and Mm, your dad wasn't really around. So I think, and you were moving a lot. I feel like there's probably a lot of kids that would have been like, I can't believe we have to move again. I just made friends. Fuck this shit. I hate my life. I hate my parents. I don't want to move again. I don't want to be the dad. It sounds like you came in naturally with a 
better attitude overall? Um, that is somewhat true. That is also, I have changed my outlook. Uh, I mean, I, every, everywhere we went, it didn't even matter how old I was, I always had a girlfriend. So I always had to break up. Every time I moved. So I was not a happy camper when we had to move. On a lot of these moves, I was pissed. I was, but I still did what I needed to do. And eventually was like, okay, I'm glad we left. And now I can look back on all the times and experience nothing but happiness and gratitude for that. Yeah, at the time, no, I was not like, oh man, this is great. Yeah, we got to break up. I got to move to Alaska. It's fine. I have a smile on my face. No, I was bawling my eyes out at like 10 years old. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've been able to craft the ability to look back. And honestly, because I struggled with crippling depression for like a decade, uh, not quite a decade, um, my teenage years, like crippling, just insane depression around every topic you can think of. Um, and it did have to do with some pharmaceuticals. That's why I have a real bone to pick with them. Um, it was it was because I got thrown so deep into the depths of like the dark night of the soul. I had no choice but to start crafting this overly ridiculously positive mindset to make up for and overcome what I was naturally falling into. Like a lot of people my age are flip and depressed. They so many are depressed, anxious, scared, fear, anxiety, all, all of it, all of it. Um, and if I, if I didn't have the experiences that I had and wouldn't have intentionally started crafting the ability to not have that anymore, I'd be in the same boat, be in the exact same boat. So can you talk a little bit about the period that you went through where you were depressed and what you felt like con contributed to it? Be you, do you, here's a better way of saying it. Let me reframe that. Do you feel like you were depressed because you had a chemical imbalance in your brain? Or do you feel like you de were depressed because of very real, very normal, very natural things going on in your surroundings that were contributing to it? So both, both. Um, my so the the natural one um which also just wasn't kind of natural um my, my mom struggled really really bad you ever sees this mom you are the absolute love you and you know that um she struggled really 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 hard like couldn't get out of bed days and i did like everything for the kids got them to school made food all that um, and I kind of just picked up on that depression. Um, and then like I was, I was decent. It was just, it was what I was naturally around so much of the time that it became something that I adopted. Um, and then I got put on Accutane, which is like the most aggressive acne medication you can make in a lab so one i had the most dusting acne you can imagine i've yet to meet another person in the physical who has had worse acne than me it was that bad so at that time i'm 15 16 my face is disgusting um i'm pretty depressed so that that definitely played a part in my depression i was just pissed off because i was gross to look at um and then the medication they put me on, there are warning labels upon warning labels upon warnings. You are feeling depressed. If you are suicidal, please tell us. Um, and oh, I was all day, every single day, wanted to kill myself. I myself to sleep, thought about it all the time, um, planned it decided I'm going to do it. Obviously, I never did it. Um, but I knew that I couldn't tell anybody that I was feeling that way 
because they would me off of the acne medication. And I needed to get rid of that acne. I, I, I had more emotional attachment to, I need to get this off my face, to I need to not feel like I want to kill myself. Mm. Um, and honestly, my mom and I talk about this a lot. The, the real, probably only reason at the time that I did not literally pull the trigger on myself um, is because I have a, I have a little brother who is 12 years older than me, who was major, not planned, huge surprise. Um, and he was like, he was really, really young at the time, three years old. Um, and what the world. And I thought, dude, there's no, you can't leave. Like you can't, you can't quit when he's three or four years old. That's selfish. Um, so he, he is definitely what kept me around. That's remarkable. It's it's almost like your little brother is kind of like a guardian angel in physical form. <laughs> Very. Yeah, he, he, you think I'm an old soul. Some people think I am an old soul. That kid, he's 12, almost 13, is ancient. Ridiculously ancient. Makes me look like a toddler so much of the time. Do you feel very karmically connected to him? Do you feel like you've Absolutely. had many incarnations with him? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so he was here to keep you or keep you alive. He is here to keep you alive. Yeah. Yep. Yep. He, he, he's a huge part of the reason why I don't have a motorcycle. Hmm. Why I don't, I don't do certain things. Have you shared any of these thoughts or feelings or, or conversations with him, or do you still feel like he's a little bit too young in, so, in this time? Oh, yeah, we're already past that. Um, <laughs> I, I've told, I've told, I've told him about the world for his age. Um, when he was like during, during 2020, during like the whole C-19, when I really, really woke up, like the battle of dark and light that's currently taking place in the world. I did not hold anything back from him. I gave him all the details about everything. He's nine years old. And I tell you, he, he doesn't remember all of it at this time, but at the time he comprehended it. And he was like, yep, I know that. Like his, his soul was like, yep, I know. I know. Yep, I already knew that. I know he just nothing threw him for a loop. He didn't think it was weird. He was like, yeah, that makes sense. And then he, he would, so he would, he would put things together. He would, he'd be like, oh, so that's why these kids act like this. That's mm -hmm. why these kids treat me like this or they treat others. The very, very, very good comprehension of what's going on with He's very, very fortunate to have you, I mean, as are you to have him as a brother, but mm, that you're kind of like passing the torch to the next generation and giving him the gift of critical thinking through what you were sharing with him. Yeah, critical thinking. That is, that's something about my upbringing that I didn't mention and that I haven't told you before. Um, my, my mom was a huge, even though she was super depressed for a very, very long period of time, she gave me the gift of being at a very young age. Um, I started reading like a little nerd at like six years old. And at around 11, 12, she started giving me Ayn Rand books. It's like Atlas Shrugged, Anthem, some just really, really mind crafting in the right direction book that you just don't usually see it. And then as I went into my teens, I was just reading Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Marcus Aurelius, all the philosophy you can think of, um, which was just weird for a kid at the time, but it was definitely my ability to think. Even though I was being a complete idiot, I, I, was, I was also at the time crafting my brain to think properly. It's amazing. So you could say then, for example, 
you chose the family that you were born into. This is my own personal. I mean, it's not my own personal theory. It's what I've kind of been, you know, percent. yeah. That you chose this family. So you were going to have these experiences. So you were going to be educated in this way or informed of the world in such a certain kind of a way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Every, every, um, I'm super blessed, like so stupid beyond blessed in like every aspect of the human experience. I got to come pop in. I'm decent looking. I'm white in the United States in the 21st century to a military family. And I was raised to think really, really well. Um, you don't you don't get much luckier than that. And that that is that is a huge reason. I think I was given the wake up calls that I was because like Spider-Man to who has much great power, a lot of responsibility. So I feel like because you, you really don't get much luckier position than me, you better do something with it. You seriously better do something with it. You have a massive responsibility to do something with it. So I love everything that you just said, and not that you need my approval in what you just said, but I'm just going to one thing that you said that I, I was actually smirking when you said it, which is that you said that you're white, right? And mm-hmm. now that's almost like it's a disadvantage to be yeah, all you know. the things that you just said. It's like you're a male, you're yeah. white in America. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about kind of the way in which the world is reframing all of these strengths that you had shared to now be something other than the way we would perceive it to be? You know, that is kind of an interesting thing because those this, those advantages have somewhat become disadvantages in the next few years. It might not be nearly as advantageous to be in the United States as it was once thought was. Um, I still see it as an advantage. I mean, not, not really. I think, uh, I know I want to frame that. Um, I think my I think my upbringing was I think the way that I was cultivated was still a massive advantage. Um, I didn't really have any scarcity. I didn't I didn't I didn't feel like I was less than, except for like my own inter mind issues with like self worth and worthiness that we all struggle with the human race in general, we all struggle with feeling not worthy or like we're not enough. Um, that's just a program that's been put on us. There's nothing you can do about it, except just continue to make yourself more worthy. Um, but I, st- I, st- I still feel like the way that I was cultivated what was a massive. Ed- can you speak a little bit as to why you might or what you, why you believe that perhaps these things are being reframed on the world stage to no longer be seen as mm. advantages, but are now disadvantages? I think to put us on a level playing field, level playing field, I think, ah, uh, it's always a tricky one to talk about. Um, I think so that there can no longer be this oh you only are able to do that because you're white where i mean if you look at colleges i didn't go to college i didn't go to college i would never go to college um i know too much about college i know all of my friends that went to college and where they're at um but if you look at colleges and who's able to get into where it's a massive disadvantage if you say you're white Mm -hmm. anything else you're you're going to get in it's going to be cheaper they, they want more of you. They have to have a certain race of person in the workplace. You can get picked just because you are that. And personally, you some people can see that as an advantage. I don't see that as an advantage because the world is just making it a little bit easier 
for you to not be the best. Mm. I think, I think like, if you look at, if you look at the, the black community, there are some monsters that come out of there. I mean, I mean, some just absolute crazy, ridiculously on point men and women that come out of that community because they know they have to be the absolute best version of themselves to get where they want to go. And then by them knowing that, by them knowing that they have to be, they have to shoot for being a hundred times better than the best white dude in whatever this is. They end up being 50 times better than the best white dude. And they're the best. I think, I think, I think that the world, when they cater to certain ethnicities, I, I think that's just been more of a disadvantage. I think, I think it's almost a reflection to show that ah, even if we give you all these things, you're still not going to do this. I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, I think, I think, I think when you give somebody a, a pass or like an excuse or, Oh, you will, you, we'll make this easier for you because you're this. I think that is a major disadvantage, major disadvantage. Well, we're doing away with personal accountability. And now it's like, you know, well, where, where did we actually see this pop up a few years ago, which is you have to wear a mask to keep your grandmother alive or you're going to kill her mm. or you have to wear a mask so you can keep your neighbor alive so it's taking away the sense of personal accountability and responsibility and it's like we're we're giving it to somebody else mm -hmm. so now we're no longer responsible for ourselves someone else is responsible for you mm -hmm. i never wore a mask, <laughs> wore a mask. been kicked out of so many stores um yeah i used to I used to go into stores and they would tell me to put a mask on and I would tell them that um, I'm mentally insane and that if I put a mask on, um, yeah, and I would rip all my clothes off and streak through the store. And that usually got them to leave me alone. Did they yes, ask you to leave the store saying. or did they leave you alone to shop in the store? Uh, <laughs> it, depends on, it depended on the person. It depended on the person. Usually, usually, and my fiance has seen this, um, because when I came to Los Angeles, it was 2021. And I had never, I wasn't wearing a mask in Washington. I wasn't doing it. You couldn't make me. Um, she always wore a mask. Just because you, it's LA, you wear a mask. Um, but I showed her that if you walk into a store, and you make direct eye contact with that person who was about to come tell you to put a mask on. If you make eye contact with them and you telepathically tell them that, dude, I don't need a mask and you do not want to come talk to me with a big old smile on your face, they don't come near you. They do not come near you. I love that you just shared that. The almost like leveling up when you're, when you're talking to somebody where you are being the most empowered version of yourself that you can be, where you're not asking them permission energetically. Because mm -hmm. here's the, I know so many people that, you know, over the last few years would go into stores, they would say, I'm not wearing a mask, but they weren't energetically committed to it. It was like, mm -hmm. almost like they were, their energy was not congruent with the words that they were saying. Yeah. Their energy was asking permission, their words were not. And then they were told, no, you have to wear a mask. So it's all about the intention in which you're approaching somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Usually I find it best to not use words because we're, words, words are, if you can just look at somebody and tell them that they don't want to come have words because they don't, they don't want to know what's going to come out of your mouth. So do you feel, because you've, you've actually kind of, you're talking about telepathy and you, before you had spoken about your gifts, one of your gifts and abilities. So I'm curious if you are, you obviously know about gifts and abilities. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of what your gifts and abilities actually are? Like in a concrete sense, probably not, but I could give you some big 
samples, I guess so. Um, I can ask for the debt, no problem. I don't really do it anymore, um, not recently, but I can, I, I can, I can tell somebody something. I can, I can give somebody a message. Um, like I do it with one of my very close friends in Australia. We practice it all the time, where we won't talk for like a week, and hey, like don't call me unless I tell you to. And we mean telepathically. And every time that I like sit and meditate, I'm like, hey, I need you to call me within an hour. Within an hour, he's like, hey, what's up? Um, wow. Yeah, that, that stuff's real. That, that stuff, that stuff is, it's just frequency. It's just like, just like your phone to phone is a frequency, your thought to thought is much more powerful. We've just never been, we've never been taught to think about it, talk about it, practice it. It's seen as voodoo, witchcraft, um, woo woo, whatever. But yeah, it's all very real. And that's the thing is the forces that keep us down, rest, use it all day long. Absolutely right. Absolutely true. So and I like kind of, uh, first of all, I like discussing these things because, well, duh, that's kind of what I'm into. But also, I want to really normalize having these conversations. And normalizing, yeah. you know, the topics that ordinarily would get people to like roll their eyes or be like, that's mm -hmm. fucking bullshit. No, it's not fucking bullshit. So mm -hmm. I like to talk about it. And I know that a lot of the viewers on my channel as well, they're kind of maybe not necessarily sure what their gifts and abilities are. So I think it's very helpful to hear the perspectives of other people saying, I'm not necessarily sure what mine are, but this is the way that they show up for me. Yes. Oh, got you that that i can do um transference of energy transference of energy is definitely one of them um and that that is kind of plays into what i feel like my mission on the planet is is a transference of energy i have a ridiculous capability to feel love and gratitude and joy um, and happiness. Like I've done probably a thousand plus hours of the heart meditation and like empowering the electromagnetic pulse of my physical heart and the heart chakra. Um, and I can, I can transfer that. Like I, it's definitely easier when I hug somebody and transfer energy from my heart to somebody else. Everybody can. Everybody can do that. That I would say is just one that I have put a lot of time and hours into cultivating. Um, and then that also transfers into like what I was saying. Like I can look at somebody and interact with kind of their higher self. Because usually, like if I'm walking into Trader Joe's and it's June of 2021. And there's an old man working there with a mask on. I look him in the eyes. I'm not looking at him. I'm looking at his higher self, saying, hey, you should really get your boy to turn around and walk the other way because this is going to be very uncomfortable. And then he just turns around and walks the other way. Um, so communicating with somebody's higher self, um, speaking belief, into somebody that their higher self is aware of mm. but they have that disconnect that we all have like your your angels can believe in you god can believe in you a certain amount but we're not able to hear it it, it needs to be more so often it needs to be conveyed by somebody at that ability to speak true belief based off of truth about a person to them in a way that they are actually able to believe it because it is true and they just haven't ever looked at it from that level. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm kind of curious how you became aware that these were your gifts and abilities. Um. <sighs> how i mean I, I discovered the heart through meditation honestly everything everything kind of through meditation and then just wing 
these things and being shown, hey, man, you have a gift for that. And then going harder with it and being like, oh, that's something I can do. It really benefits people. I'm going to go do it more. And then in just reps and the repetition of it, you get better at it and you have more conviction around it and you realize that it's even more true and you can just do it all day long. I love that you said meditation because I mean, I talk about this all the time, guys, meditation is the magic. It's, it's the shit. It's where the shit is at. It is not shit. It's the shit. It's the bomb.com. Meditation is where it's all at. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I would not be anywhere near who I am today. If it were not for meditation, I've during, um, during the whole lockdown, very beginning of the lockdown, I went and lived in the middle of the woods in Washington for like a year and probably spent hours in meditation. I mean, like full days straight for meditation straight. Just every single chakra, um, every single kind you can think of. And I feel like I aged just years in that time. Mm-hmm. You had mentioned before spiritual awakening, um, and I forgot at what point you said that you were going through it, but can you speak a little bit about um, what that experience was like for you? And if you could also just refresh my memory, when that had actually occurred? So it started when I was about... I would say about 18 when I actually started to understand the metaphysical side of things. Mm -hmm. And that's also when I started meditating, but it it was also psychedelics. It was, it was Mm -hmm. most definitely psychedelics were a big driving factor in opening up that part of my mind, um, specifically psilocybin. And uh, anybody that watches this is familiar with all the research that has shown what that can do to rewire the brain and the pineal gland. Um, That is where I started to see the metaphysical side of the world. And then just taking meditation and driving it deeper and deeper, deeper intentionally the inside of my mind. So as I went deeper and deeper within, I realized about everything that was going on on the without, the outside. Um, And then when it comes to that, that was like the kind of the basis of how that started. And then 2020, 2019, C19, all that, that is where I came into the realization. There's like, oh, we're in like the middle of a war of dark and light. And we're on the earth during a cyclical moment of transformation and we will never go back to anything that we can do normal and we're right on the cusp of an evolution of consciousness cool (laughs) wait and this was you were having those realizations because you were actually taking the psychedelics that's wild um (laughs) No, was that, it, that wasn't around the same that time. Wasn't, that, that, that was a couple of years after. So that mm. was that was 2018 and then 2020. Wow, it's only, only two years, not even two years. Um, but I guess in my eyes, I'm there's a long time right now. <laughs> um but yeah, during when, when, when everything when everything got locked down, when everybody started freaking mm. out and everybody started believing all the crap, I was like, there's something going on here. There's something going on, somebody's lying. Nobody's dying. Um, what's going on here? And then I started to learn how it was going on. Oh, this is just a giant part of their plan to squash consciousness and destroy our civilization. I love how awake and aware you are to these things. It's like we don't have to like pussyfoot around. It's like, yeah, we're happy to Get what's going people. on. Everybody yeah. Knows it. Yeah. Terrible people have been running it for thousands of years. They yeah. Need to die, if you ask my humble opinion. So the question is, how do you think um, they were aware of the fact that we were going through this massive 
energetic upgrade and energetic shift that precipitated their efforts with C-19. So I think you know, um, that all these forces that run the world are aware of astrology. They're all aware of the cyclical nature right? and all the cycles that we go through. And it was, it was, it was the perfect time. It was the perfect time to inject the highest level of fear and anxiety into the collective consciousness to keep them um, elevating to a level of where we could. Because if you think, you really think about where humans could potentially be right now if we didn't have these evil bastards pulling everything all the time and poisoning us and plotting against us and destroying the planet and starting wars and making us all hate each other. And if we were able to just operate out of love and the heart center and creation, we could, we'd be thousands of years ahead of where we are. Yeah. And then we'd be so advanced they wouldn't be able to control us. So it all, it all. So it's basically all the things that we have been cautioned against using is all of the things that they have actually been utilizing on their behalf while telling us simultaneously, no, astrology is a joke. You should not be studying it. No, you do not have these gifts and abilities. Even mentioning it makes you crazy. Meanwhile, they're all playing with their own gifts and abilities. Yeah, absolutely. It's so absolutely. diabolical. Absolutely. Inverse reality, complete inversion. Yeah. Whatever they say is a lie. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think Candace Owens had actually said something so perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you know exactly, right? Like if the government says you need something, no, you don't. If awesome. the government says something is good for you, no, it isn't. Basically, whatever the government says, do the complete opposite and you'll be fine. Yeah. The government says don't eat this. Find as much of it as you can. Eat all yes. of it. Yes. There is so I much. Okay. So I am. Hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> Right? Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. I've recently been falling down so many rabbit holes of like the health and wellness industry. Holy fucking hell. Like, so yeah. again, when I was in New York, my mom was talking about like, you know, <laughs> when she was growing up, her dad would have coffee and he would put a whole stick of butter into it. But she was saying it like, can you imagine? And I was like, well, actually the research now is starting to show that butter and meanwhile i'm not telling her i put ghee in my coffee every morning i don't even drink coffee but in my matcha every morning for mm. the health benefits but mm. it's like all the things that we have been told like oh no butter's no good here's margarine. cholesterol cholesterol is bad right yeah oh eggs are bad fantastic for you. and the new research yeah. is coming out actually how beneficial Think. eggs are like yeah <laughs> red meat yeah Eat as much red meat as you can. But the there's good, a the fresh, the fresh stuff. That's 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 one benefit I had as a kid. Is my dad was a major hunter. Mm. Dad, dad hunted all the time, so we rarely ate or bought steak. We ate deer. So that that's that's like the most nutrient dense meat you can get. So we were we were brought up. We didn't we didn't have. I mean, we still we we still. Ate that was in the stores that our parents weren't aware of. But we also had fish, a ton of clean meat. Um, I think that was a huge reason we've been less anything like our, our like our microbiomes mm. are very healthy because of it. one of the ways that people heal their gut is by eating clean, like fresh red meat. So you basically were actually raised on the OG grass-fed organic meat diet. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So there's actually this this is kind of making me kind of curious about something, which um I don't necessarily want to 
frame it in a way where it seems like I'm attacking vegans. Here's why. So first and foremost, I was a yogi for many years. I had a guru. I still actually have a guru. Um, I was vegetarian for, I believe, 12 years. I was vegan. No, I was vegetarian for 10. I was vegan for two. I'm a recovering vegan at this point where I do actually eat red meat. But I'm kind of curious what your take on it may be where hmm, yogis, can, can two things exist simultaneously? I'm kind of really curious to get your take on this because yogis believe in this idea of you know nonviolence where we don't want to harm an animal to mm. benefit off of its, its meat or to benefit off of its, its body to create mm. like leather materials. And I'm kind of curious if you feel like maybe, I mean, there is some, you look, look at the yoga sutras, there's validity in that, but if also, can it exist simultaneously, not to cause nonviolence, but where also maybe even the yoga community has been hijacked with this idea yeah. of veganism? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would say, one, I did, I did vegan for a little bit. I did vegan for a little bit to detox, I mm. think vegan in a healthy way it can be great for your microbiome to detox off of certain heavy metals, um, certain things that you know a lot of meat aren't going to flush out of your system. Um, now I am not even anywhere close to vegan now, and I only was for a very short period of time. Um, in terms of the non- violence. I would say you have to look at what you define as violence and what you define as nature. Mm. Um, do you call a lion eating an antelope or do you call it nature? I have very sharp canines. I don't think I was, I mean, I have like ridiculous canines. I don't think I was given those so that I could only eat plants. Mm. I think the animals that are only have molars, only eat what they're supposed to eat. Um, I, I, I think it, it all comes down to nature and also seasons. And that kind of comes back to where like the migratory aspect comes in is I don't think we should always be hunting down buffalo. Um, but when it's the season for it, I think it's a good idea. Um, there are a lot of places where they have, hunting. What, what what hunting does is it helps to thin the herd as well, because mm -hmm. when you don't, because especially in the states, there's not really any predators anymore for deer. Like there's not really bear. There's not wolves. Um, humans have become the apex. So if you were to just stop hunting deer, their, spe their species, like their, their little population, they're going to get diseases, going to get unhealthy, um, and there's going to be problems caused. Like the weak, the, thin, the weak needs to be thinned out by some kind of predator. That's just nature. It happens with fungus, it happens with trees, it happens with every type of fish, like the slow gets taken, the sick gets taken. But if you, it's kind of like, it's kind of like communism. Like if you, if you just let everybody run wild and not have any responsibility and you don't need to produce or be any kind of fever in any kind of way, the population is just going to slowly degrade and implode on itself has to be some kind of nature happening. And it doesn't need to be, I wouldn't say quite survival of the fittest, but just nature. Hmm. Nature nature needs to be allowed to take its place. How much do you think we've actually messed with that then with all of our modern advancement, just you know, moving into cities and the modern agricultural practices and banning hunting? Mm -hmm. so much so much um like amounts when you look at it. when you look at food when you look at the way humans get food yeah i mean that's and that was part of their plan 
That's part of their plan. Create an emotional attachment to something that is actually positive for them, mm. um, like hunting in the proper way and make it bad, make it evil, and then give them a solution of, hey, uh, you can just eat this fake meat and you cannot feel bad. But in the meanwhile, we're actually poisoning you and programming you and weakening your species. So, I mean, it's that was like that with everything. It's like that with literally everything. Don't go, don't go to, don't dig a well. Don't, don't dig into the earth and get your water from the earth. Just get your bottle. Meanwhile, all of that plastic that has no reason to be around just destroyed. Mm. I think that's a really, really good point. And it kind of actually makes me want to go back to what you had shared before about uh, being on antidepressants. Mm -hmm. um, and that you had said you kind of have like a bone to pick with uh, big pharma because of that. So can you share a little bit what that experience was like for you? So I was never on antidepressants. Okay. I never, I never took any kind of antidepressants on purpose. Um, that's why it was a struggle is because I would not let them put me on them. Um, I was on the medication that made me as suicidal as all get out for like a year. Um, but I chose not to go on those because I saw my mom go on them. Mm. I saw what they did to her. They didn't help her. They just made her gain weight and hate life more. Like they, they didn't do anything. I'm not doing that. Um, <clears throat> and then for, for years, for years, um, I say they, but like kind of doctors or psychiatrists that I would, um, antidepressants. Nope. Nope. I'm going to suffer. I can fix it in my own head. Um, my bone, I would say my bone to pick with uh, the pharmaceutical company is just, they, they know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. Um, they know that they're only treating symptoms. They don't treat the root. Um, doctors don't know about operation and all of the reasons that humans have these issues. Like my specific reason why my why all those things were happening to me because that medication dehydrates your body so much that everything gets, I mean, I, I was literally like picking, like peeling flakes. I mean, like cheap, like entire cheap size flakes it was drying out my skin so much. I mean, like the worst dandruff you ever imagined. Um, and what that was doing because I mean, you're taking it orally. So it's, it's going into your teeth, it's hitting your, your gums, everything, and it's going straight into your brain. So I was dehydrating my brain to the extent of where I literally had voices all the time. Like that's, imagine you have like a vacuum. And you're sucking the water out of your head and your skull and your brain. And it's just like short circuiting. And that's basically what medication does. Well, that's wild. Yeah, it's, you kind of realize that our bodies are like what, 60, 70, 80% water, our brain, how much water your brain needs. When you're on, dehydrating on the, your brain, that can cause serious depression. On the molecular, on the molecular level, we're 99% water. Wow. The level we are literally made of water. That's wild. I I actually need to think about this for a second. <laughs> I have like one of my son's books. Um, he's very into science, and actually, there's this page. What I'm thinking of right now, where it kind of talks about that men actually are a higher concentration um, in their mass is water than women. But it's just interesting. I didn't, I hadn't thought about like the molecular component that we are 99% water. So it's a really interesting kind of new way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the brain. 
especially the brain. I mean, it, it, it's like a jellyfish. A jellyfish. That thing is, is water. That thing is liquid. And that's why, like, a lot of people with concussions will, because, like, what a concussion is when your brain smacks up against your skull, it uses, because it's made of water, it uses water to heal itself. Mm. So it's pulling, it's, it's, it's needing more water to heal itself. And so when you're not giving it water, and you're not giving it the right water, because most water is wrong. You're just, your body is, is, is looking for something that it doesn't have. And yeah. it starts pulling from organs and it starts pulling from your liver and it pulls from your stomach and your eye and your spine. And it's just pulling from all these places to try and fix something that it doesn't have. Hmm. It's like the Fed printing money. It's not real. It's <laughs> worse. <laughs> oh, I love that. Do you want to weigh in on? Mm, speaking of the feds and commerce, do you want to weigh in on QFS? If you think it's real, what the hell you think is going on in the world's economy yeah. right now? Yep. Let's go there. Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, so when I got out of um, underwater welding, I actually ended up in finance. Um, I worked for Nationwide, the insurance company. Um, I lasted about like two years there. And then Specifically got out because of QFS and cryptocurrency and everything. I was like, hmm, okay. Um, finance seems like the right place, but pretty sure everything's about to collapse. And this is like 2019. Hmm. And this is this is one of those instances where everybody calls me crazy and everybody calls me insane for saying banks are gonna start collapsing. And now it's 2023 and I, I told you so. Fine. I still love them. Um, but yeah, yeah. Getting into, getting into XRP, QFS, um, the gold standard, BRICS nation, just seeing where all of that, I mean, that's, that's very real. That's been real for a long time. Um, yeah. Russia, China, India, South Africa, Brazil, they're, that, that's been in the work for a long time. And that's why we have our current administration, uh, idiots. Um, I don't know if they'll get flagged if I take them. Probably not. My administration. Don't, just don't say their name. You can say the current administration. Don't say their name. Current, admin, current administration. Um, has done everything they can to destroy our economy and our relationships with those people so that the states can fall and plummet to its economic so that this system can be put in place and the U.S. citizens can be in the worst position possible to get no benefit. Because if we were all just aware of it and we were taught about it, like, hey, citizens of Earth, we're going to change the financial system. This is how you can prepare for it that would probably go over pretty smoothly if you did it over the period of like a decade. But instead they're calling it all a conspiracy and doing it behind closed doors and calling people crazy for looking at what's happening. And the only ones that will benefit from it are the ones that have the guts and the education and the knowledge to put their dying money in the right place to be worth something when everything gets switched over. So I'm going to disagree with you there. Uh, not okay. because I worked in finance. Um, not because, not for any other reason other than that I believe all of these systems are coming down so it can be rebuilt, but rebuilt without corruption. And mm -hmm. I think we need to be bankrupted. Mm -hmm. We need to also bankrupt the cabal so that way we can usher in QFS. So that's the only reason that I disagree there because I don't feel like it's to put us in the worst position. I feel like it's to usher out the out so we can bring in the new. I think we're on the same page. Yeah, I think we're okay. On the same page. I think that there's forces that are working. Well, if you, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that the current administration we have in here right now 
is doing everything they can to take all of the citizen inflation and rising. Um, but no, I, I do think that everything is being done is being done to bring in the new in a positive way. It's just that the evil that's holding on wants to make it as painful as possible for as many people as possible because they're losing. Well, here's the question. Do you feel, is it really, because you already said that you feel that's what's going on, but is it really that the dark forces want to make it as uncomfortable for us as they can? Or is it perhaps you can't tell people you have to show them? They need to oh, yeah. go through the experience as if all of these things were going to happen because that's the ultimate way to wake people up. That's the ultimate red pill. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is that that is kind of where I get like how aware are the actor in the movie, like the current administration. How aware are they of the parts that they're actually um I think that depends if you think that it's Biden or if it's an actor. Oh, I said him. But bye bye. <laughs> so it really, I think, depends if you think that it's actually bye bye man or True. if you think that True. it's an actor that's playing him. I don't think it's him. Yeah. I don't think it's him. Um, well, we're on the page. We're on the same page there then. <laughs> I don't think that's, that's, not, that's not him. No, that's not him. Or else he got some plastic surgery that doesn't make any sense. It's wild because so many of the, um, there's so much information out there right now. You can like literally see the back of his neck where it looks like it's a mask, where it's bubbling up, where it's mm -hmm. like shifting under his collar. And like, yeah. it's everything is just out there for us. All of these little breadcrumbs are there for, for us to pick up on, you know, it's, it's all there. You just have to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Well, I think it's, here's also the thing, you know, people have been very, very severely brainwashed. So oh, yeah. I like to give the benefit of the doubt. And I'd like to say they're just comatose. Yeah. And to what extent, how much is it going to shake the foundation of the beliefs that they have to accept these things? Because, you know, the one example that I always go back to and that I always give is think about like people in the medical profession. To know that these are people that have taken an oath to do no harm, and then to find out, well, actually, their entire practice, what have they been doing? They've been causing harm. So it's almost like the more educated you are or the more engrossed you are in the matrix, the harder it is to say, I'm going to let go of it now. I think that those people, they will, they will, be, they will be the strongest in revolt when they finally see it the ones the ones that were yelling at me and calling me a grandma killer <laughs> or not getting the jab jab or not wearing a mask those ones when they finally see and everything gets put together they will be like i think i'm a truth warrior they will be monsters in the revolution or They'll go entirely insane. <laughs> like, there's probably not going to be any really big difference. Yeah. They're completely like, ah, you lied to me and you made me do all these things. And they realize they're like serving Satan the whole time. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll be like complete, complete and utter switch immediately or they'll go absolutely insane. And exactly. I hope, I really, really like the, the positive take that they're, they're gonna be the truth warriors. They're gonna be the fighters for the good. I, I really, really hope so. I, I hope yeah. that that's what comes to pass and not that those are all the souls that are like, okay, I'm checking out, see ya, peace out, man. Yeah, yeah. Because they are also, the ones that had their, kept their job, it's because they've had to be jabbed multiple times. So yeah, conceivably they could be yeah. Okay, but we're going to keep it positive. I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep it like a positive vibration. So I am curious from you if you can share what is one or more of your favorite conspiracies that you believe to be true. Mm. 
my favorite um that i do think is true i definitely think it's um that how do i say it? it's the trees it's the what now? Trees. trees i think the earth used to have giant trees i think if you look up um the devil's tower in wyoming it's like this couple hundred foot um, rock formation that looks like a tree stump that has a hexagonal cellular structure to the whole thing i think that's a stump i think that's a stump just like how fortified wood is solid as rock i think that's a stump i think a lot of toes that are perfectly level i think those were cut i think those were cut i think that um the movie avatar with the blue people um is like a disco documentary and that beings came here whether it was us humans somebody else i don't know um and harvested the place for and we are in i think canyons or big gravel where resources were dug up took other places like gold here like the the Anunnaki needed gold to protect because gold gold is the reflector. We even we use gold. We use thin sheets of gold on satellites to protect them from the sun when they're outside mm. of the atmosphere. And if you think of it in theory, if a planet was if their atmosphere was dying and their sun was going to basically fry them, one of the ways they can protect themselves all gold from a planet back to their planet and creating a shield so i think earth has basically been ravaged for all of its resources even though it is absolutely beautiful where it is now i think it was ravaged however many millions of years ago that is wild but you know what what you're saying makes a lot of sense it's a little out there but if you just need to look, physically go to the Devil's Tower, look at the like hex, literal hexagons that make up this 300 foot rock, you're like, mm. and then you look at the cellular structure of a tree, like, that was probably a tree. That was probably a tree. Well, first of all, we like out there over here on this channel. So, okay. Like don't it. please don't feel like you have to edit yourself. We, <laughs> the more out there it is, probably the better chance everybody's going to actually want to fall down that rabbit hole and research it. Yeah, um, go look it up. It's true. So you feel like there was very possibly giants on Earth? Absolutely, okay. absolutely, yeah, hundred percent. Where did they go? Do you believe? Um, you know. They might have just been smart and left. Um, <laughs> they might have gone to inner earth. Um, mm. I totally believe in Agartha or inner earth or something on the inside. Or honestly, I have not gone super down this rabbit hole because every time I look at it, I'm like, ah, I don't have time for that right now. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> the flat earth um, and how we're we're just we're just one little piece and everything else is outside they might be out there i don't know um i do think okay here, here's a pretty specific one all of the ancient civilizations that kind of disappeared off the face of the planet at the exact same time like 11 to thirteen thousand years ago um i think they all left like they like they're they literally left to either Sirius or Orion or the Pleiades, all of the constellations that are perfectly lined up with the structure of their temples. Um, I think they have the ability to harness like the energy of frequency and transport themselves, whether that be their consciousness or their physical bodies. Um, but it's not a coincidence that on several different 
of the planets, all these civilizations just kind of disappear. I'm sitting over here nodding my head like a damn fool because actually that's what has been shown to me that they all energetically ascended and they all left earth at the same time. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So you are spot on the money there. Nice. Good. Yeah. Not that you need the confirmation. I love the confirmation. <laughs> but I've, I've actually never even looked into this idea of um, like earth being pillaged for the resources. But it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I think that's something that I actually am going to look into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you, if you actually, you were going to say something, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Please finish. Um, that, that, that kind of, that is where my um, real passion for migration kind of comes from is it's like all these civilizations left, but then at the, at, at a, at a similar point in time agriculture was introduced all over the planet in different places um at the same time i don't remember what it was um and they have all like the sumerian tablets of the anunnaki and everything and they're teaching about um and they have quetzalcoatl in mexico and all the aztecs and everything um like agriculture and like structured farm wheat and barley and all of these kind of things that give humans the ability to not have and what these like carbs or like wheat and these kind of things what they do to the body is they make them more stationary they make them they make them more dense you're mm -hmm. not you, they make, they make you less likely to round. They make you, they make you less liquid. They make you a little bit less liquid, a little more dense. And over time that affects the bone structure that affects the brain that affects the skin that affects everything. And we don't have to go and hunt for food anymore. It's just grown here, which now it's grown by machines in terrible places. Um, back then it's almost like, that was the introduction of the industrial food complex. It's like you don't need to go move. You don't need to go move around anymore because we need you to be slaves and we need yeah. you to build this thing. We need you to not be spending your time gathering your food, moving around. So that's that's where I get the passion about migration. We were, we were meant to move around. We've been like DNA or our DNA has been manipulated to make us be more stagnant and stationary. It makes a lot of sense why you're so passionate about it when explained so concisely and so poignantly exactly in that way. And also coupled with the experiences that you've had of moving so frequently that mm -hmm. you really have these experiences that a lot of people don't have. Mm -hmm. A lot of the friends that I grew up with are you know, grew up in, in one town, have never even moved. Out. Sure, they go on vacation, but have never even moved out of that town. And I think it's just so interesting that through the lens of the experiences that you've had, you can kind of just share how incongruent that actually is with our internal DNA. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And we were, and, and because, because um, dad was a hunter, and it was all boys. It's all boys. Um, even when he wasn't there, we were trying to hunt something. Like when we were living in Alaska, we were chasing moose and we were catching fish in our surroundings. And when we were in Virginia, we were shooting squirrels. We were shooting rabbits. We were, dad was shooting deer in the backyard. So like we were, we were in harmony with our environment. And it was different based off of each geographical location because of the animals and resources that were available. So we were mm. always just naturally kind of integrating with whatever geography we were around. And it felt very natural. That was, that was the most, that was the most happy I've ever been running around with my little brothers, like catching fish and squirrels, even though some people might not like that. 
um, that, that was the most naturally human I could ever feel. It makes me want to actually ask them, like, how incongruent you felt living in big cities. I know that you actually lived in L.A. prior to moving. Um, how incongruent did you feel? How out of alignment did you feel living in big cities? Um, at, the at the beginning, at the beginning, it was just horrendous as I had come from such a like foresty environment. Um, so it, it, for the first little bit, my body just felt just completely in the wrong space. Um, but then, like, like I kind of said before, I just kind of accepted that in this time, in this age, this is an environment that is natural. It was mm -hmm. created by man for man. Um, it, it is a, it is a natural occurrence in humans evolution and our cognition and everything. And so I need to learn how to get on with it and be harmonious with it. And I did, I did for a while, like towards the end there, like it wasn't so bad. Like it, it's a city, it's whatever, it's fine. Um, and same thing when I was in Seattle or in the big cities, whenever I would have to go to Atlanta, uh, I mean, it feels, I would rather be in the world, but it's natural. It's a natural occurrence for humans. Um, so I just kind of learned to integrate with it and accept it and accept that I'm in a state of migration. And this just happens to be the environment that I'm going through. Um, but yeah, my body and my energy will always long for that mm -hmm. forest and the waterfall. You have such a good perspective about it. But, you know, also the reason that I'm asking is you're just hearing so much from other people who are feeling like as they're starting to ascend energetically and becoming more aware of their own internal energetic state and the spiritual component and how they're feeling like living in a city is no longer congruent with them. And yeah. they're kind of wanting to explore this idea of maybe homesteading and what's it going to take to get a bunch of people together and moving out into the country somewhere and having like your own little community. And it's just so interesting how this is, it's, it, it's coming up so frequently. Oh you yeah. Know, it's, it's really like coming to the fore in people's minds. And, and it does, in a way, seem like it's a much more natural way to live in small communities than in these huge megatropolises. Yeah. Disconnected from nature, disconnected from our family. Yeah, I think they're all they're all they're all based on consumerism. I think that the homesteads are more based on production yeah. and creation because you have to produce what you need. Other than that, you live your life. Um, but yeah, the cities are all, it's all just consumer it's a meme really where he has sunglasses on and he puts them on and there's like obey, consume, yep. control. I guess that, that, that is the city. Yes, I agree. I agree with that entirely. I think that's, that's think, actually based on a movie. I have to watch that movie. I don't remember what it's called, but the guy, um, like yeah, this. I know it's a movie from the eighties. Yeah. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with the reference, you maybe have seen a meme of it before where it's a guy, he kind of looks like he's from the 80s because he is, and he has sunglasses. And when the sunglasses are off, he sees the matrix, if you will. And then when he puts the sunglasses on, it allows him to see, you know, beyond the veil. And yeah. it allows him to see where one person might see like an ad for Pepsi Cola. He sees obey or he yeah. sees yeah. buy. And it's it's actually based on a movie from the 19. I'll have to find it and then I'll link it down below. Um, but um, what did I want to actually say about that? I had something. Else. Oh, it kind of almost makes me feel like we've traded the dopamine that we receive from being self-reliant and being productive and taking care of our own land and growing our own crops and taking care of our own people. We've traded that natural dopamine production for like the short cheap hits that you get when you buy something. 
we've replaced real and natural with completely fake and artificial. And I think so many people as they're waking up, they're kind of becoming savvy to it. And they're like, this is not really what my, my soul is longing for anymore. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Every, everything is so, so artificial. Every, everything that ends up in your body or going into your body or you smell or visually see, if you live in a city, it's all artificial. I think that that's where like the split is happening right now. Like, especially with artificial intelligence, um, people are going like just deep, deep, deep into it or nope, that's not for me. Yeah. I'm getting back to their true natural humanity. Yeah. Now, as I have a lot to say about artificial intelligence, but I'm actually doing a video on that. So I don't want to talk too much about it now, but um are are there any conspiracies that you don't necessarily believe to be true, but you just think they're kind of like fun to talk about, think about, throw your attention at? Um, the fact that Michelle Obama's a dude <laughs> is the one that comes to mind. Um, That's my that personal favorite. That, that might might be true. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked too deep into it. I, I think I think some are manufactured. Um, to be so outlandish and and false that the people who believe the true ones are seen as crazy. People will be like, oh, well, do you believe that? So you're obviously not. Um, um, There's a lot of truth to that, by the way. I know, Where yeah. Even like the truther community has been infiltrated Absolutely. with the intention of making us appear to be crazy. Yeah. Absolutely absolutely 100 percent um i know all the hollywood stuff is true i know all the hollywood stuff is true which is so sad um which apparently that's coming out with the curve out with all the trafficking and everything um so that's sad and exciting at the same time um <laughs> but other conspiracy um i really used to knock on flat earth and Ah, but I keep seeing maps and stuff that my brain's like, dude, that might be real. I don't have time for that right now. Yeah. Um, I, can't, I can't really even, even think of anything that is a conspiracy theory anymore because the, the, term, <laughs> the term conspiracy theory doesn't even really pop up in my head anymore. Yeah. Because it's just, there's just a bunch of truth and it's just a bunch of um, like plots or plans. Um, yeah, I'm kind of stumped on that one. That's okay. But I agree. It's almost like the more savvy and awake and aware we are, the less the, con the so-called conspiracy fall, they fall away because there's yeah. so many of them that we have come to understand are true. So it's like, well, is that a conspiracy theory or is it just something that the evidence hasn't been presented yet? Yeah, yeah. Aliens is a good one. Um, is that a conspiracy aliens. though? <laughs> no, not even close. Yeah. I mean, but there, there's a lot, there's a lot of like supposed conspiracies around it. Um, but the whole like CIA files and them releasing stuff and like the the what the, the Pentagon just said a couple of days ago that we will soon be facing um, threats that are outerworldly. And that just goes back to if they say something, the opposite is probably true. We're, we're probably facing something that they don't want us to look at. We're um, probably what they mean is we're probably soon going to be releasing blue beam, blue beam technology, which will present the idea that we're actually being uh, confronted with uh, extraterrestrial life, but it's really not, we're just controlling it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do think, I do, I do somewhat think we have those um, consciousnesses, consciousness of other somewhat alien species helping us, guiding us. I know a lot of people tap into like the Pleiadians, Arcturians, Syrians, Andromedans. Um, I think I think those are definitely real and prevalent. Mm -hmm. 
as we're in right now. Yeah, they are. I picked up on them. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really channel um, extraterrestrials. Um, actually, I actually really haven't ever tried to. I wonder what would happen if I tried. But they, they have come through more in the periphery where I'm aware of them, but I, I don't really commune with them. I commune yeah. with my guides. My guides have allowed me to see that they are in fact real. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I stay in my lane. I stick to my my guides, my guardians. I don't want to get too far out there. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to start to wrap it up. And I'm just curious if there's anything else that you would like to share that you think is maybe something that would bring comfort to anybody that is watching this or maybe something that would be insightful or thought provoking. Um, meditation, meditation. If you, if you are not, if you're not meditating yet. Um, I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. I will tell you that that is the most impactful thing that I have ever put any attention and awareness into. And that I would not be who I was today without meditation. And it gives you the ability to discover who you actually are on the inside. And I personally feel like if you don't know who you are, then you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. You don't know what you're being called to do. And yeah, I don't want to say you're going to waste your life, but there's a reality in which you could have a very, very amazing human experience if you start to dive deep inward and discover who you are um, and why you are and how you are, what you are. Um, and I think just going deep into the soul and the brain and getting right with your mind will give you the ability to be the highest of yourself during which it's going to be a bumpy one. Uh, we're just getting started with the whole collective consciousness shift and the best thing you can do for yourself and others is getting really, really solid and right within your own mind and your own heart. Very well said. And my Instagram is David of Gaia. I'm going to link it down below. Yeah. So for anybody that, first of all, if you want to get your daily dose of inspiration pertaining to working out, David, is a, <laughs> you know, you're a beast. I watch you work out and I'm like, like, I need to up my workout game here because <laughs> you're, you're, in a, you're in a different league. Um, but I appreciate that because it keeps me motivated. There's, there are seriously some days that I'm like, I just worked out yesterday. I'm not doing it again today. And then if I'm on Instagram, it, I see you working out. I'm like, <laughs> get on the fucking floor, girlfriend. You are working out. So yes, thank you for keeping me committed. Good job. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. So very, very, very good inspirational feed. And I love to finish with this one question, which is what are you most looking forward to for the new world or the new earth or the new vibrational expression of where we're going to be or where we're going? However you perceive it to be, what are you most looking forward to? I feel, you know, I feel like the things that I'm most looking forward to um, aren't going to happen in my lifetime. I think, I think humans, I think the human consciousness enhancing to a level where we're able to get to the root of so many problems um, and those roots being taken out and fixed and hydrated and the next however many generations deep it is that don't have to grow up many issues and hardships um, on their physical bodies is going to be amazing like kids they get to grow up and not have all and, and not be poisoned all day long from every which way mentally physically in their organs, in their minds, um, would be a really, really, really beautiful. Mm. I think that is such a positive place to end the interview with. And thank you for that.
Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Of course. Thank you for sharing your experiences, your wisdom, your openness to just speak so honestly, soul to soul and connect in this way. I'm truly appreciative. And I think that um, for all my viewers that are watching this, this was a real treat for us today. So thank you, David. Absolutely. Absolutely. If any of them want to connect with me, you're welcome to send me a voice message. I will always respond. Um, yes. Any questions that you think my particular experience can help with, I can absolutely help you with that. And I'm yeah. all of you, whoever you are, no, I can't. See you. I'm linking um, your Instagram down below. And please, guys, check out David's page. He really, really, really is an inspiration. And thank you for being here with us today. Yes, ma'am. Good. I'll talk to you soon, David.